Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Anyway, she managed to put in some whole bunch of spinach plus a bunch of parsley. I haven't seen that one before, but people keep figuring out new ways to make it worse. Ooh, <laughs> that doesn't even taste good. I mean, well. no, it's parsley is so bitter. <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> it's nasty. Anyway, well, so Sally, I think Zach, is, <laughs> Zach has got us on record right now. So let's, oh, let's kind of get you going here. Um, so as you know, we had a fellow named uh, Elliot Overton on the other day, and we had a discussion about oxalates. And, you know, I, I think it's we, – we cover a lot of times topics more than once just because there's, there's much more uh, to it than just, just an initial glance. And um, it's always good for people to hear more and more, and, and we get that on. So we, we thank you for coming. I saw your video – Maybe it was ancestral health from a couple of years ago that I watched, and it was very fascinating to me. And I, it was just, as I kind of went on my journey, it was one one more sort of, you know, sort of bit of knowledge that I gained that, that was like, okay, you know, maybe we don't need to be eating all these particular foods all the time. Maybe they maybe they become problematic for us. But tell us, for those that don't know who you are, a little bit about your background, just, and then we can get into talking about whatever we can, whatever whatever we end up talking about. Okay, great. You know, before I get into talking about me, I just wanted to say to you both, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, it's, to me, it's quite profound. Uh, it's like you're saving modern humans from complete enslavement. <laughs> we're, try, we're trying to. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll we, say- We are I'll under say, the deranged spell that, you know, comes from all kinds of places that our economic investment in commodity-based agriculture, our, uh, you know, commercial greed and our general comfort and the ease at which we can be sucked into sugar, convenience, and the whole protection of conformity. I mean, you guys are just going after it in such a quick way. And in, we're in a situation right now where we need that kind of, uh, you know, superhero. I'm like thinking, you guys, are, maybe, maybe we should have a future Marvel comic, you know, uh, big bad beef guy and his sidekick, Zach. <laughs> and I'm thinking now I need to get some Wonder Woman bracelets. And join the <laughs> there, there we go. We get empowered to be the, be the, what is it? The, Infi the Avengers, the, the nutrition Avengers or something. There you like go. That. There we go. Well, Save the world from their, its own stupidity. Yeah. I'll yeah. add this too. In, in terms of being informed and prepared, I don't know that we've had a guest quite to your level yet, Sally, uh, you actually reached out to me before asking for the file of the Elliot Overton interview so you could make sure that we picked up where we left off or added to that one so it wasn't just kind of a rehashing of kind of, I guess, what would maybe be considered kind of a 101 with oxalates as we kind of rolled that topic out for the first time to our audience. So um, that was very kind of you to spend even more time than what you're going to give us on the interview itself to do a little homework on the side. <laughs> Homework well, is the name of the game when it comes to oxalates, and nobody's sure, done enough of it. Sure. Sally, where where are you located? Just because I just I'm know. in Richmond, Virginia, where okay. we're now having a beautiful day for a change, and flowers are going crazy, and it's beautiful right now. But we've had a year of chronic rain and clouds. I've been to Virginia exactly one time in my life. I was there in Blacksburg for a. Ah! A weightlifting contest in college, where I where I was in the first, I was one of the first powerlifting meets I did. That was back way back in 1989, I think, something like that. So, yeah, Virginia Tech. I, yeah, Virginia Tech. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's really there. pretty there. Really nice hiking territory. It's right off the Blue Ridge Parkway. Very pretty. Yeah, it's really Richmond is just a um, couple hours from there, and I'm sort of halfway to the beach from there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember all the pre-trees. So tell us quick, give us a quick your background and let's get into some of these okay. non oxalates and see what's going on. Well, I've been a nutrition geek since kindergarten. 
In seventh grade, I saw a film strip showed by my science teacher and decided that I would get a degree in nutrition because how cool if you knew what to eat, you could avoid cancer and heart disease and disease, you know, you could just have a good life. You could be productive and have fun and not be sick. And that really appealed to me because probably because I spent my years before kindergarten sucking down a lot of penicillin. And by the time I got to kindergarten, I already had my tonsils gone. So I was like just instinctively drawn to the idea that through nutrition and lifestyle, you could have a future worth living. And it completely didn't work for me. I did go to Cornell. It's the only school I ever applied to, except for UNC and Chapel Hill, where I also got a master's in public health. Those are the two schools I applied to because I'm very clear about, I'm about helping anyone who will listen to choose that better life that's more productive and free of disease and has a low number of doctors in it. <laughs> I mean, age seven, I mean, that's early. Golly, most kids are not thinking about nutrition at age seven, you know? It like was seventh you? grade, yeah. Tenth, oh, okay. I was 12. Oh, okay, seventh grade. Okay. 13, going on 13 and deciding, oh yeah, this is my thing. Yeah, I was always interested in food. In fact, I was interested, so interested in food that I ate anything you gave me except maybe dessert. I would like three portions of whatever, big eater as a kid and liked vegetables way too much. I regret that. <laughs> Started growing <laughs> vegetables in, uh, I was nine or 10 when the a uh, friendly elderly lady who was a friend of my grandmother's uh, started a community garden and my mother taught me to grow Swiss chard because it's a cut and come vegetable and beets and beet greens, which grow really easily up in Syracuse where I was growing up. And so I grew up eating high oxalate foods and thinking vegetables were delicious <laughs> and they were good for me. It didn't work out. I never had that problem. I always hated vegetables from being a kid. I remember, it's particularly onions. I never liked them. It's kind of weird. I remember my dad would put onions in this meatloaf. And I'd say, Dad, I don't like the onions. He goes, he goes, you can't even taste them. Shut up and eat them. I was like, well, if you can't taste them, why'd you put them in there? And he, I said, <laughs> and, you know, so I kind of had those battles. It's kind of funny. My, my dad, years later, and my dad went on a carnivore diet about two, a year and a half ago, and he's 75 now. And I asked him about the vegetables. He goes, yeah, I never really liked them anyway. I was like, why did you make me eat them damn things all the time? <laughs> ah, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, I, no, I like sweets. Golly, I love I loved desserts growing up as a kid. I wanted to be – I want, somebody asked me what I wanted to be from an early age. I did an interview with Marika Sorbos from South Africa. She goes, what did you want to be early on as a kid? And I said, I wanted to own a cheesecake factory. You know, not like the rest, you know, because I love cheesecake as a kid growing up. I love that sweet stuff, but, uh, and I still like it. I just don't eat it anymore, but uh, interesting. So I think that's yeah. safer than the uh, Swiss chard and beets. Well, we'll talk about that. So let's talk <laughs> a little bit about, you know, I mean, so I, I would, Zach, what episode number was Elliot when we, when we had the basic oxalate talk? He was, he was number like uh, 87, I think. No, not, oh yeah, 87. So he, yeah, he just came out and released. So he's 87 for you guys that, want to listen to these in tandem uh you can go back and say do you want to can you comment on his if you listen to it can you comment on his talk and let's let's figure out where we can expand upon things um <clears throat> yeah I'll t i just want to also point out your the basic logic you have about okay if you're putting onions in the meatloaf and you can't taste it what's the point i think if you use logic i think that's what got you guys to where you are like <laughs> Using logic, so thanks for doing that. Yeah, Elliot, I'm so glad he's taken an interest in this topic. Um, there's so few people who have picked it up. What happens in the often for for some reason looking for a lower berry, actually blueberry's okay. <laughs> and he said, oh, because, you know, it's very hard to recall this level of detail because it's a big confusing morass when you start looking at the content of chemicals and foods. If foods are so diverse, I mean, there isn't one species of blueberry, there's probably 70 species of blueberries and how many have been tested and you know so anyway that gets me off on a tangent but I'm really glad that he introduced some basic concepts I think that you need a longer deeper dive to really figure out um, and see and understand oxalate oxalate is not one thing it's, it starts off as oxalic acid, which is this tiny chemical, which is just a two carbon chemical that's highly reactive. It's a very acidic acid. It's almost always got at least one proton gone. So it's always got this negative charge, at least one, but it has two protons, it drops and tends to have a double positive charge in it. 
that makes it electric and interactive and it's a chelator of metals that have positive charges and interacting with the electric nature of the body. So, you know, the way information is passed around the body is not just through the nervous system and the slow hormonal system, but a very rapid system of electrons running around on this matrix that runs through cells and between cells through this extracellular matrix, which is not even well understood in research and how that's affecting whole body communication. And unfortunately, in a lot of our biology, we've taken the life out of biology. We've, at best, we're looking at a monolayer or something like this, and we're thinking about biology in a, a format that we're required to now with research, where you have to narrow down your specific games is, does A and B cause C, and that's the end of it, and without the context of life itself. And so our analogies about the body often are very mechanistic. And I think this is why things like the genome and the idea of um, clipping things in and out of genomes is so popular in science right now because it's much more mechanical to tape, take a long tape of genetic code and just cut it up and stick something else in it. It, it. We can think about biology in a very simplified mechanical way instead of this bigger um, thing called life itself and what is making life work. And I think, you know, what you, some of the genius of the carnivore diet or the justification for considering this as a legitimate therapeutic diet is that it's in the context of life and it comes from the context of the understanding the human experience of living on the planet versus our theoretical notions that we can narrow down in a research study. Yeah, so I, I often, you know, because, and as I watch this sort of unfold and people try to explain the mechanisms and I think that's interesting, but I always, always in the back of my mind know that any mechanism we describe, we will find that it is modified and changed and, you know, situationally dependent. And it is so much more complex that to, to sit there and try to, you know, have this reductionist thing this if A, you know, causes B, then, then A causes B equals C in all situations. And I just don't see it that way. And so I, that's why when, when people tell me, what's the mechanism, what's the mechanism, I'm like, I almost don't care. I just want to know what the results are. And, you know, I, I think, you know, talking about some of the stuff, you know, it's, it's so complicated and so complex. Uh, hmm. You know, it, it becomes frustrating when people ask me some, some of these details and I'm saying, yeah, that may be true, but it may not be true in all situations. And, you know, there's, like I said, any, anything I learn, I know that it's, it's going to be changed five years from now anyway. You know, when we come, when we, right. when we get into this, highly, highly specific, specific enzyme, specific biochemical pathway. Uh, I'm sure when you started learning about oxalates, uh, you've learned tremendously more that have changed, you know, some, some of, you know, what you knew about the mechanisms, maybe not the results don't change, but the mechanisms and the understanding changes. But, you know, what was true about human biology, physiology 50,000 years ago is largely true today for the most part. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, somehow this is lost on people that you could look at biology itself and look at our own history and cut through the clutter of fighting over how much fiber you need to eat. You know, to me, that's just having an argument on the Titanic about who should get in the life raft. Get in the life raft. <laughs> All right. So what do we need to know about oxalates? You know, I, I, you know, and we talked a little bit off about, you know, behind me is a picture of a green kale, spinach, who knows what smoothie in there. Got a little lemon juice in there. So it doesn't taste quite dis as disgusting maybe, but uh, tell us a little bit, a little bit, a little, your, your, your overview of oxalates and then maybe we can, we can go into the deep dive stuff, which you, which you okay. allude to as being important. Well, to go into a deep dive, we would need two and a half days, and I could talk about oxalate forever. <laughs> um, and let me start off to say, I, I think, you know, one of my insights is that those of us who are clearly been oxalate poisoned from the lifetime of trying to eat well, our history of vegetarianism and veganism and just striving to eat well, and of course, women are prone to the greens aisle. They're very prone to produce. <laughs> 
as a group. And uh, my generation, you know, I'm 55, born in the 60s, and our, we are your terrible nightmare. You should be looking at how we've ruined our own health and life if you're younger than we are if you want a clue as to what not to do. I think vicarious learning makes a lot of sense. Don't do it yourself. Let someone else make the mistakes. And I always thought I was the vicarious learner, but it turned out I was just the big bad example of someone who will end up with what I consider to be metabolic PTSD. So oxalate along with, especially in, but even by itself, without this context of too much carbs, too much access to carbs constantly, the background noise of the effects of vaccines on the metabolism and the immune system, the background effects of destroying the microbiome with antibiotics, and then just trashing the liver and kidneys with endless use of pharmaceutical and over-the-counter drugs, solvents on every commercial product you can imagine, toluene and nail polish removers, pesticides in the air that we're breathing. We also have oxalate in the air we're breathing because oxalate turns into a, uh, it comes from the combustion of plastics and fossil fuels. It's in the air we breathe as well. Oxalate is also in cleaners. So we're not only eating it, but there's other ways you can get into trouble with oxalate and then it can start deranging your metabolism. Yeah, so that's a, I mean, that's an important point because you talk about this milieu of, sort of damage that we're taking and i like that term metabolic ptsd but you know some people obviously are more affected by certain foods than others and, and i do think maybe there's perhaps there's some genetic underlying predispositions but also there is this environmental damage that occurs ahead of time and maybe it's through a lot of the other garbage we eat in our diet you know like there's people will say well i'm a vegetarian and, and i'm not my i'm not sick and there are people that say, well, these, people, these cultures live to, you know, a long, long, healthy, ripe old age, and they're not sick, and they eat these plant foods. But at the same time, we're seeing more, it seems to be more and more, that we're seeing people that, you know, these, these people go on a vegetarian, vegan diets, and they, seen, they end up with a destroyed gut. They end up with autoimmune disease. They end up with depression. They end up with, you know, all kinds of problems. And so is there, is there, uh, is this a, like many things, it's probably a combination of hits. You know, like we used to have this somatic theory of cancer where it was, you know, two or three hits before you could get cancer. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, the different things. So, so is there, is there, do you think there is, do you think there are some people that can eat oxalates to a certain level, maybe, maybe not a ton, but just to a certain level and, and do this completely fine. And there's other people due to environmental or genetics, you know, environmental epigenetic or genetic susceptibility that they're going to have more issues. Right. So oxalate is a known lethal poison and the lethal dose is, is very instructive here. So what's the range? And lethal doses, we always talk about range. How much of this substance does it take to kill you flat out in a short term period? That range is from 3.5 grams to 30 grams. That's a phenomenally broad range, but how much it takes to kill you. Now, if you were to equate what is 3.5 grams that's kind of like 3.5 smoothies. Up, maybe you need 30, are you the person who needs 30 smoothies to kill yourself in a few hours or do you only need three and a half smoothies? What's the difference? The thing, yeah, the thing that really makes oxalate poisonous is not just that it's also full of crystals. The stuff that you don't absorb are the bigger crystals that cause abrasions and cause immune damage and mess with the endothelial lining of the entire digestive tract, but what gets in? So the absorptive surface, what's the state of the absorptive surfaces of the mouth, the throat, the stomach, the small and large intestines, and the anus, the whole way through? What's the state of that absorptive surface? Well, if you have any kind of inflammatory bowel disease, if you've had surgery to your gut, if you've got any kind of IBS, reflux, if you got issues with digestion, then the chances are your absorptive surface is allowing a lot more to get into the bloodstream. So the other thing that makes it really deadly is distribution in the body or getting into the circulatory system. So when it's in the blood, it's particularly noxious and toxic because it's in these small forms of being an ion or a nanocrystal. So you get yeah, ion is an individual molecule. This is uber imperceptibly small, and it takes about eight pairs of them to form a nanocrystal. 
Now, crystals of any kind are toxic in the body. A nanocrystal is the most toxic form because you've got a lot of surface area because one nanocrystal means lots of nanocrystals and they're very small. They can, they're smaller than you know, a triglyceride. They're really little. And so they can pass between triglycerides and the membrane pretty passively and move around. The, the cells try to control that if they're healthy and some of them can. Um, however, in the literature, they equate the nanocrystal of oxalate to asbestos crystals or silica. So silica is what causes black lung disease and everyone's heard of asbestos. Crystals are not good. And the thing about oxalate is it doesn't get caught in the act of being toxic. It, the body disappears this stuff really fast. So even in the original experimental study done in 1822, it was published in 1823 by um, a brilliant scientist who was a jurisprudence. He was a medical officer of jurisprudence in Edinburgh. They had just come up with this post and he was the first one to get it at age 24 and held this post for like 10 years. So he did this study in putting oxalate into the stomach of animals, mostly dogs, but he also did some cats and rabbits. And then he would tie off the top of the stomach so it, the animal couldn't vomit it out because your first reaction to oxalate when you're at the level of you're gonna die soon is vomiting and hiccuping. And what he found was very much this. He, it was, it's a great study, it's available, it's from 1823, and everything he found out is still true. So some of what we can observe about the toxicity of oxalate goes way back to the dawn of toxicology itself. Um, let's see, what were we actually talking about though? <laughs> what was your question, really? Well, you were gonna just kind of give us a little overview on oxalates. Yeah, and then... to the toxicity and all of that. Right, so I think it, it's easier to think about it if you think about the fact that we're talking about the oxalate in food and you have to eat it. So it's coming into your body through your intestines and that, though, that circulation around your stomach and intestines goes through something called hepatic circulation. So that means that everything you absorb goes straight to the liver, right? And it floods the sinusoids of the liver. These cells of the liver are broad and wide open. Like they let this stuff come through into them because they're the ones that are gonna clean up the blood and store the folate and the vitamin A and grab the good stuff and knock out the bad stuff and make it safe to carry on because where's the blood heading next? right? It's got a three inch journey up the inferior vena cava to the heart. That's a very important organ to the body. <laughs> the body cares a lot, so it puts the liver in front of the heart and sends nutrients straight to the heart and then off to the lungs for oxygen back to the heart. So the stuff you're absorbing from your diet goes through, like what could be more critical than your liver, your heart, and your lungs? And you're exposing those organs to oxalate with every meal today. It's only been possible recently that you could get so much nuts and seeds and potatoes and berries and Swiss chard and <laughs> sweet potatoes and French fries and potato chips with every meal, that you're flooding those critical organs at least three times a day. So just in the acute phase, you're, you're stressing those tissues out. And I really believe that you're deranging and using up the glutathione and the other um, self-protective uh, elements that those cells have because literally oxalate depletes your glutathione and it, it affects these metabolic pathways. It also affects your epigenome in the process. So your metabolism itself can change because how your genes are expressing themselves, which is how you produce the enzymes that runs the metabolism in the mitochondria and keeps everything going, that all depends on the epigenome being helping you to read the right part of your genes, you know, so this whole thing about genes, it's about epigenome and the epigenome is being affected not only by your grandmother, her lifestyle, because the, the ovary that made you was made in your grandmother's body. And so her diet and lifestyle and the epigenetic effects of that are being passed down in three generations, but we also have today all these other effects that are changing how the genes are read. So you've got changes, you've got immediate acute problems that include stress on the cells. A lot of uh, free radicals and that thing, that sort of thing are 
happening, wear and tear in a cell. But in the meantime, the body, what he found in 1823, and it's still, still true today, is that you don't really see the oxalate in the bloodstream. It disappears fast. And there's probably at least three mechanisms where there's a quick clearance of oxalate from the blood. The kidney researchers now own all the oxalate researchers research, and they're quite convinced that all the oxalate in your diet that you absorb is probably not a lot, which they have been wrong about. But what gets into your bloodstream just goes straight to the kidneys, as if your entire body was made out of PVC pipe. That makes no sense at all. What does make sense is that there's uh, the process of the body itself wisely knowing it doesn't want a lot of oxalate in the bloodstream and specifically doing this um, catch and release process where it's going to hold on to oxalate waiting for the the wave from the diet to settle down and waiting for the kidneys to be ready for the rest of it it'll hold some of it back so that a you don't lose all that calcium in the in the blood so quickly that your heart rate is affected because the pacemaker depends on a certain level of calcium in the blood and that's usually what kills people in acute poisoning from oxalate is the heart goes into arrhythmia and it fails and that's because of the rapid drop in calcium. So the body's quick to throw calcium back into the bloodstream and then move as much oxalate out of the way as it can, waiting for the moment when it can be released. Unfortunately, that moment requires a change in the blood level. If we're constantly eating it. That's when we get into this accumulation process. But accumulation is going to happen anyway because any cell that is damaged doesn't have the glutathione power to protect itself or it's just not metabolically active and it's just a chunk of the proteins that hang around in the cell membranes and on the membranes of the mitochondria are sticky to oxalate. Oxalate and they stick together and so it gets hung up in tissues that are dividing, injured, reproducing or if you, know, if you have a lot of insulin going on you're going to see that annoyance to the endothelial lining in the vessels. Well, oxalate is another major annoyer of the epithelial uh, lining. And, and there's, they're now talking about a generalized epithelial disorder. And, and things like insulin and oxalate are probably the two biggest contributors to that, because those are the things we're most exposed to day in and day out. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. Hey Sally, one thing I have a question about that is I actually kind of thought of this looking at Sean's background, <laughs> but uh, um, like in you know I guess it's fairly recent that we would even take like a bag of spinach and blend it up into a small tight little package that you can just like gulp down in a matter of seconds have we seen any type of like uptick or issues with just our ability to be able to consume oxalates at that quantity versus like that little bowl of spinach that Sean has behind the smoothie, which would be, you know, you add some stuff to that and that could be a full meal, but be a way less kind of right. like dosage of it. So has this like this, the smoothie revelation type of thing had, con do you see that showing up in people's uh, abilities to tolerate things now that we can kind of get it down in a lot of a, a, a bigger bolus? Well, it, what's happening is that despite the deafness in medicine about this problem, it's breaking through into the literature. Certain researchers like at the Mayo Clinic where they have some awareness of oxalate have demonstrated that people who go on these smoothie cleanses end up in renal failure. 
there's a group in Pennsylvania who did a, a, a report on three or four young children, like age four to nine, whose mothers had been giving them almond milk instead of milk because of perceived lactose intolerance. And those kids had extreme renal failure. And they just told the parents to stop the almond milk and the kids' renal failure rebounded. So even, it doesn't even take that level. It's just that now we're going to a level of pushing oxalates. Like the invention of almond flour is a murderous idea. It's, almonds are toxic in many more ways than oxalate, but the oxalate in almonds and peanuts is very bioavailable, which means a lot of the oxalate in the almonds gets into your system, as is a potato chip. I mean, so you can be trying hard to be healthy with your vegetarian, vegan, or paleo lifestyle and kill yourself on spinach and almonds, or you could be a couch potato sucking down peanuts and potato chips. Both of them are great ways to get into trouble with oxalates. And so, Sean, I know you know it's really the side dishes around the burger that's the problem. If you go out for dinner and you order a steak or a burger, they want to know what you would like with that. And what's it going to be? I usually ask, Fries for, or chips? I, I usually ask for another steak. For me, I ask for another steak. That's my steak. <laughs> but everyone else is being asked. For you, they probably know you already because you're getting known, right? But everyone else has asked, would you like fries or mashed with that? Like potatoes are, have been a standard side dish. And so with this baseline of like, all right, let's go back a little bit in time. 1850s, the international expert on urine analysis was this fabulous, brilliant man named Golden Bird. And he died at a very young age of, I think it was 39, of uh, kidney infection secondary to kidney stones. And he was the expert in urine analysis. And that's because he really cared about his urine because he had what he called, he and several colleagues in, in the UK called the oxalic acid diathesis. And he understood that oxalate was causing more than his kidney trouble, that it was causing him general misery, fatigue and joint pain and exhaustion and, uh, musculoskeletal issues, you name it. So they define the oxalic acid diathesis as a diagnosable condition where the requirement was gastrointestinal problems and the illustration of the issue was either rheumatological issues, neurological issues, uh, pain, and maybe a urinary component and that was it. Like, okay, if you had digestive problems and you had either neurological symptoms or aches and pains, then, and it, if it was seasonal, for them, they still had seasons, Zach. So he was a tea drinker, obviously. That's why he got in trouble with oxalates. So he was probably drinking four or five cups of tea a day. And potatoes are big there. So he's probably living on potatoes as his major side dish. And then in the spring, this oxalic acid diathesis thing would suddenly break through and they would see people coming in or complaining about their joints in the spring, they'd say when the rhubarb came in, that's when you'd get, you'd see this seasonal disorder. So we have a baseline and then you throw in this high level of the rhubarb lifestyle, which is now the spinach and the smoothies and the almond bars and the nut bars, you're gonna start getting aches and pains, but you don't see this because no one knows about it. So the connection is never made between the diet like it once was in the 50s, in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it kind of just goes, in, goes along with what we've talked about a bunch of times on this podcast is that, you know, so many people are walking around in a less than ideal state. They've tended to normalize that. And then when they look to their friends and people around them and they see them in that same state, they're like, well, this is just how it is. Or they attribute it to, oh, I'm getting older or this is happening. And they never really connect the dots to what's really causing the problems. Yeah, Sally, I think, um, you know, because you made the point of acute toxicity and people dying, and most people are going to say, well, there's not there are any people dying of smoothies. It's, just, it's not that a common event. I mean, it may be, you know, you're going to see isolated cases, in particular in people that are already compromised. But more important, I think more relevant to the general population are what are the effects of sub, you know, sub lethal right. doses of oxalates? Because I think that's where the real interest in, in my interest is. You know, I'm not. You know, no one's going to tell, I'm not going to tell, you know, somebody to go drink seven, seven spinach smoothies. I mean, that's just retarded. But I mean, you know, 
where, where do we get when we're eating this, this, you know, this modest, moderate dose of oxalates day in and day out for year after year? What, is, where, what does that potentially lead to? Well, Sean, you should get a job in toxicology because the toxicologists haven't bothered to ask that basic question. So what if you need 30 smoothies to kill you, then, then it's fine. So we'll just ignore it. And the field of nutrition has chosen to ignore it. The field of medicine and the field of toxicology all have chosen to ignore the idea that, as Zach was saying, disease is not our natural state. We accept ageism and aging because that's what we've created because of the way we live. We're not supposed to be in sick and, and in pain. We're not supposed to need a doctor and doc in a box on every single corner. So we have to think about what are the two major causes of disease? They are toxicity and deficiency. And the, our plant-centered eating has created this tsunami of illness. And we can't see it because it's so normalized. The disease is normalized, the diet is normalized, we've never really truly connected the two. And oxalate is the perfect example of how hard it can be to connect the two. You can be pigging out on sweet potatoes and Swiss chard and spinach smoothies, and you're so convinced that those are the safe foods, you never can put it together. And this is, goes back to Sean's question about, so what are the chronic effects of oxalate? You know, you've got this acute, annoyance to the whole system, your kidney, you're wearing out your kidneys, you're wearing out your liver, you're stressing the epithelial lining of your vessels. And of course, what comes along to try to fix all that damage is the lovely balm called cholesterol, which is there to hold the tissues together so you don't fall apart. And then of course, once again, oxalate is not at the scene of the crime always, although it is often found in plaque and found in artery, arteries. And that's part of what we're probably measuring with arterial calcium scores is how much oxalating garbage you have there. So you've got this chronic effect of the body has to kind of stash it to survive and protect the heart and the vital organs. So the other tissues are holding onto it and stuff tends to settle down into the bones because they're going for calcium. Calcium is the magnet for oxalic acid. It might come in as potassium oxalate or sodium oxalate, but it's gonna start grabbing iron, magnesium and calcium. And as, it, as, as its tenure inside the body ages, it's probably all settling down into the bones. And what we see in the studies is that these bigger deposits tend to be wrapped up in dead white blood cells and proteins. And that's a form of mummification where we can dampen that electric nature of the crystal, and kind of like insulation around the wire. And so that's quiescent. You don't get any symptoms from that at all. That's just hanging out and making your bones weak and making you prone to injury. If you notice how easy it is to tear a tendon or break a bone these days, little kids are getting their knees redone. And this is just poor quality bone. Because oxalate is affecting all the processes of growth, maintenance, repair, all of that stuff in the body. You, you cannot, so connective tissue. Oxalate consumes and destroys hyaluronic acid and the basic principles needed to rebuild and maintain connective tissue. So you end up with weaker connective tissue because you cannot keep regenerating that connective tissue and taking care of it. So you're gonna see thinner skin, uh, injury proneness, you're gonna see aches and pains or needing orthotics. You're gonna see that the normal wear and tear of the day, say you type all day, doesn't recover at night like it's supposed to. You type all day and you create some inflammation in your arms and elbows and tendons involved. And then at night, it's supposed to recover and repair. But if you have just had three meals of oxalate during the day, you're so high in oxalate overnight, your highest point in your bloodstream is going to be at bedtime. You completely lose that period of time of tissue healing and recovery. You also wreck your sleep. So, you know, you see that's one of the many neurological symptoms that come along with oxalate is your sleep degenerates. Mine, I had a sleep study done and I, I could no longer work. I, I was post hysterectomy, I quit my faculty position writing research grants because I could no longer work. I needed a total hysterectomy, everything had to come out. I was a mess inside, including endometrial, so endometrial scarring on the colon, 
they're like, I was on epidural. So I was talking to the nurses and the doctor during the surgery. And um, they're like, your ovaries are a disaster. We got to take all of this out. And <laughs> I'm this healthy person. I've always been the goody two shoes who's eaten well and skipped dessert. So I could have three helpings of whatever. And um, I wasn't recovering from that surgery at all. And it turned out my brain was waking up at night. I didn't know it. I was too tired to be aware that uh, in terms of brain waves, I was in a roused state. 29 times every hour and that makes it impossible to read and think and for some people it makes them want to kill somebody <laughs> oxalate can change your mood it can give you depression agitation impatience uh, just make you kind of grumpy and irritable because i think your whole nervous system is feeling pretty grumpy and irritable that it has this vicious toxin constantly dogging its function so pretty much anywhere where you've got vulnerability, because that's part of the body that you're stressing out or genetic vulnerability, um, that's where oxalate's gonna get hung up. It's gonna get hung up in injured tissue. It's gonna get hung up in inflamed areas where you've had infection. A lot of these deposits tend to have old viruses and old bacteria in them. And so uh, when you finally lower your oxalate intake, you're totally switching a system of self-protection and kind of packing it in and holding on to it, waiting for winter when we could finally let it go. Because the body knows about oxalate because you produce some as part of your metabolic processes anyway. And we don't even know what that baseline is like. We don't know how that changes through the day or the year. They really haven't even studied the um, endogenous production of oxalate in any reasonable way. They all pretend that there's no way to put anyone on a no oxalate diet. <laughs> it never occurred to anybody that you could do all carnivore and get people off of oxalates completely. So they don't even have the basic research to understand our endogenous production, let alone this trafficking and handling and self-protection that's going on. So now because of grocery stores and 24 seven summer all year long, we are in a position where we're eating it so frequently that we're always in catch mode. So everyone has some degree of accumulation of oxalate in their body. They say most of us have calcifications in the kidney. So that's a great example of that. Some people end up with kidney stones, but not all of us. Some people end up with interstitial cystitis, fibromyalgia, arthritis. Um, you know, we could think about actual people. Like, uh, and, and your listeners, really, if you haven't already done it, you should go see a couple of very short three minute videos that I have on my website on the results page. And so one of them I filmed in 2016 at our local, I run a support group every month and at our potluck, I had a, somebody come with a camera and people were chatting about it. So I it was my first film I ever made. <laughs> and in there you'll see people like um, uh, Richard who loved his peanut butter snack at bedtime. So he liked it in the celery, you know, the little celery, maybe a raisin or two. He did that routinely at bedtime. He also occasionally liked dark chocolate as a snack. And then his wife would randomly buy and feed him some oxalate foods. And he had thumb pain. That's all. His only problem was thumb pain. But that mattered a lot to him because he's, he composes opera. And so his time at the piano was painful doing the thing he loved the most. And it took a long time. He had to come hear me speak twice to be convinced that it was worth trying life without that peanut butter. And lo and behold, his thumb pain went away completely. And he's in his mid-70s. It's just ageism that says that he should have thumb pain because he's in his mid-70s. That's ridiculous. It's the way we're living. If we can't admit to ourselves that we're sick and in pain because something we like to do isn't working, we'll never figure our way out of it. Hey, Sally, when you say like uh, the 24-7 summer, is that just like indicative of what food groups are available to us now since essentially every food group is always available to us? Whereas in the past when winter would come around, like oxalate rich foods just wouldn't be available. People would be eating a higher like animal based diet more or less. Right. And so the value of understanding that is to know that at least you took the winters off from this defensive mode. So in the summer, if, if for some reason you're in some weird community that likes spinach all the time, which is a brand new invention, really. I mean, this is not done. I mean, even in the 70s, when I was a kid, 
the California salad was considered kind of, you know, she-she food for fancy people. Like even salad wasn't done until like the post 1970s on the East Coast. I mean, maybe out there in California, salad has been a thing forever, but that's only because the economy is dependent on vegetable growing in California, not because it's good nutrition. And so much of what goes on in our world and shapes our entire world is about the economic structure of our society. I mean, the Egyptians built an entire slave-based culture on wheat and they were sick as a dog and had arthritis and all these problems. And that is whole wheat, high oxalate, high leptins, it's a mess. But you'd have to admit that your whole cultural foundation is working against your health and want to prioritize health over money. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, another topic that we kind of started to dive into a bit with Elliot that I wanted to follow up with you on was just this, okay, we know there's a problem here. Now what do we do about it? Mm-hmm. And, and Elliot said, like, before you, because I mean, listening to this, it's, it'd be easier for listeners to say, all right, I'm clearing all oxalates out. No, um, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's what Elliot said too. He said, you want to kind of gradually scale down as your body essentially, um, has developed the dependence or something about on, on the level of oxalates you're having. So if you want to just talk a little bit more about what is a good procedure for someone who's interested in reducing their oxalate intake, what is kind of the first step and then the ultimate goal with that? Okay. Well, can we do a little background so everyone can start thinking for themselves? I do not like to spoon feed answers that we don't really have yet because okay. no one studied this problem. It is a few of us who have been willing to speak up. It's, I mean, it's literally been three people speaking up about this and doing the research and spending their time. Well, you know, one of them's dead now. There's Susan Owens and I who spent a lot of time reading literature, unpaid work, trying to figure this thing out. So what I think um, is that there's a cell signaling of when winter comes, when winter comes, that is days without high oxalate meals, the body's ready to get rid of it. It's been holding temporarily. It was meant to just be held for maybe 24 hours until your kidneys are happy enough we can let it go because it's a weird thing that you got into the raspberry patch. Now get back to hunting, please. You know, it wasn't like that you would have high oxalate foods every day, let alone three or five times a day. So um, the body knows it wants to get rid of this stuff. And the way it can tell is a sudden drop in the blood levels or some, some place where it's, it's gathering this information and it's the body knows how much oxalate's coming in. Once it's got a five day break, it is ready to let things go. It's like, Oh, yay. And it's going to let it go because it's not healthy to keep it hanging around in the tissues. So I think that there's, you know, there's been no research on this, but this is based on working with people and living this myself. And, you know, Susan Owens is really the genius who figured out, this accumulation thing and that when you change your diet, all of a sudden the body can start flushing out some of this oxalate and probably it starts with the most recent oxalate. It's probably in the easiest spot to release. So if you've just had a lot of oxalate this year, this week, yesterday, that's the probably the oxalate, who knows? I mean, this trafficking and handling thing is an extremely complex biological genius and marvel that we don't have a clue about. But I think that you're, there's a kind of a set point where if you're really toxic with oxalate, like with the genetic disorder, primary hyperoxaluria, with that disorder, those folks seem to tolerate a pretty high level of oxalate because their plasma levels have detectably super high levels and can for a long time after the corrective procedure, which is a liver transplant. So whatever your kind of norm is of oxalate and let's pretend it's just a plasma level somewhere we don't know when that suddenly shifts and drops that's a trigger that something's changed it is also a trauma about to happen because a sudden a sudden change like that and the subsequent release of the recent oxalate creates a metabolic trauma and what i'm seeing in the literature there aren't that many um specific in admissions of this in these reports. The sudden appearance of primary hypoxylaria, you could be 50 years old, had this genetic disease your whole life, and all of a sudden you're dying from oxalate poisoning out of the blue. And it's often right after birth, giving birth, or a surgery or some other metabolic trauma. So 
any kind of trauma could suddenly shake oxalates loose, even just getting on a rebounder and over shaking. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could start. Your, your body is like holding back this wall of uh, toxic stuff. And if you suddenly let that wall of toxic stuff start flowing, you're going to mess up your kidneys, probably lose kidney function, depending on how sick you are, and, and feel like you're dying because you could be. So it's very important if you're really out there on the ledge of a high oxalate diet, you either keep going and drop off to your death or you step back from that in a careful way. And that's why I'm so excited to be talking to you guys because we need to work together. I am getting clients, as are the other folks in this area, that tried carnivore and got sicker than ever. They know their vegetarian diet or their whatever diet wasn't working and they're getting desperate. They try carnivore. They felt great for two weeks and now they can't eat anything and they think they're dying. It's too much of a trauma. I mean, you're going to change the microbiome, all kinds. If you're going from a high plant food diet to all meat diet, that changes lots of things. Your metabolic system, you know, how, what you're burning for fuels, what microbiome is, what's growing in your gut. It's too much change at one time for what is essentially a very sick and weak body. So we have to step back from it in a conscious kind of way. And it's tricky because we're talking about human behavior here. Once you know how much problems oxalate cause and recognize that, oh my gosh, I've been on this high oxalate food and this stuff is pretty toxic. I don't want to eat poison anymore. You, a lot of us are like, that's it. I don't want to eat these high oxalate foods and won't go through the step it back carefully. And really, you know, our intake is variable anyway. It's not like you always took in 3,000 milligrams a day every day. You were fluctuating anyway. But you need to find a way to step back from that in as gradual and gentle. So you bring down your kind of oxalate set point so that it's not a sudden release. But you're going to get to the point where you get it low enough. And for some people, it isn't even that low. And you're already, the system's ready to let go of oxalate and you're already going to start to see funny reactions in the body. What are some of the reactions you see as the body kind of purges oxalate? One of the common ones, not everybody gets this. It depends on really what your degree of toxicity is. So see the guy with the thumb pain, he didn't have the sleep disorder and the, the 40 years of eating Swiss chard that I have and my love of sweet potatoes. So he, probably occasionally gets twinges of hip pain or back pain or different things on and off. He may not even notice any of that for a whole year because it may have just been his kidneys that really needed a break and they're cleaning out and so on. But those of us who have really got a lot going on and we're, one of the things that happens to some of us is we get a sudden rash. And some, it looks a lot like what some people call the keto rash. Because if you get off your sweet potatoes and white potatoes and this and that, you may be, or your grains, whole grains, all that, you might already have moved your oxalate level low enough that it triggered that release. And that rash is an immune reaction, right? So, and if you think about a lot of pain comes after the injury. If you think about a bug bite, it hurt a little bit when the bug bit you, but the next day you have this big red welt that's itching and driving you crazy and it hurts more the next day or maybe even two days afterwards, right? And so what that tells you, that's the immune system's attempt to remove the toxin that's giving you the symptom, right? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. what's happening with oxalate. Yeah, so I see, see I, there's, a, there's a fellow by the name of Kyle Kingsbury who's a USC fighter, who works over at Onnit Nutrition, uh, and he's like their human performance or human experimental guinea pig guy. And so he did a carnivore diet, and he felt great. Everything was wonderful, great energy, great in the gym, you know, it, you know, just felt tremendous. But he had developed a rash on his abdomen, which he couldn't explain because he had been on a ketogenic diet in the past and he didn't get that. And, I, and at the time I was trying to figure out, well, maybe I'm not sure what it is. It could be something else. And I asked him and I, and I actually talked to him about that. And I said, maybe it was an oxalate dump. And he said, you know, was, I was eating a lot of oxalates prior to. And so this sort of certainly corroborates some of the things you're talking about. And I wouldn't be surprised if what you're saying is, is happening for, for a number of people. So it's great to get that information out. Thank you. Well, it's really important. I really think we need to, your, your folks are the same kind of folks as my folks. And that is people who are fed up with feeling sick and willing to do something about it. 
And so they're the same ones who are like, okay, I'm going to try this other experiment. They'll actually do it. And, uh, you know, it'd be much better if they all had this awareness because as they're trying to convince their friends and family members to consider increasing their meat and lowering their vegetables, they should really start, everyone should be starting with oxalate because so many of us are toxic in it. And, and, and those who are reluctant to eat all meat, they can improve their arthritis, their sleep, their pain, their ability to heal, their aging process, their vascular health, their kidney health, they can improve all of those things just by switching from the worst high oxalate vegetables to low oxalate vegetables. They can have everything else the same, like it's the easiest thing. You don't have to get rid of your dessert, your sugar. I mean, you can be whatever you are, just get yourself unaddicted from whole grains and almond this and spinach that and and slowly move that over and if that goes well if you don't get the dumping there then you know you can proceed and get yourself at adapted and continue to improve your health and you're going to feel enough better that you're going to be encouraged and maybe carry on and, and do that process the real question is there's no science there's only the experience of a limited number of us how do we pull these people back from this high oxalate situation, from this poisoning? When is a high meat diet the right answer? How soon should that be introduced? Maybe that's the answer we're grappling to find. Maybe that's the way you correct all these nutritional deficiencies because oxalate creates a deficiency in B vitamins and minerals flat, it just does. So it's not only toxic, it's also causing deficiencies Plus you're eating a deficient diet anyway. So those are the two basic causes of all disease. This is a very serious situation. So how soon do we introduce a meat heavy diet where meat portions get much bigger? I mean, that's one of the innovations of, of the carnivore thing is, oh, you don't just eat, you don't just add some meat and fix yourself. That's helpful, but it's not sufficient, especially if you still have a high oxalate diet. So switching the oxalates and then thinking about, okay, we can, tune up the meat to get more B vitamins and minerals is an important, when do we do this? How do we do this? We need a way to figure this out. So as a community, we need this conversation going on. We need to have this exchange of information. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's, it's like I said, having these discussions is going to help a tremendous amount of people. It's, it's, you know, it's changed my perspective a little bit for sure. Um, Let's talk a little bit more because, you know, you talk about oxalates are deposited, you know, typically they like, they, they're big friends with calcium. They love being bound up with calcium because of that divalent, uh, you know, yeah. issue cation. that's going on, cation they've got going on. And, you know, it's, I just wonder how long, you know, we talk about seed oils hanging around the tissues for a couple of years uh, yeah. before you can get rid of them. What is, do we, I mean, we probably don't know because it's not enough people have looked into this there's not any real studies but do you do you have an impression of how long these uh, these these uh, oxalates hang around in our body let's say i go on an all meat diet and i've been on it for two and a half years now are the oxalates out of my body yet i mean other than the ones i endogenously make are they still are they going to be in there for the rest of my life or what's the situation on that well um those of us living it will tell you uh, monique just wrote me i did a blog post on this the suffering that happens after you go on a low oxalate diet. So you go on a low oxalate diet, but you're still high in oxalate and your bloodstream and your tissues are just as high in oxalate as they were when you're doing your spinach smoothies. And so how long does that process of cleaning out go on? We can see from one case where they actually followed a kid with primary hypoxaluria for seven years. After seven years, his plasma levels were still sky high, still sky high. And Monique, she says now at the uh, eight to 10 year mark, she finally feels like it's over. I feel like at the five year mark, I'm at a place where it's getting more and more minor. And one way you can tell that this is going on is to look for the cloudy urine. Okay, so cloudy urine is an in, in, indicator, as long as you don't have an overt infection, the cloudy urine is an indicator of too many crystals in the urine. Right, so you got so many crystals, and if it's clumpy, sometimes you can actually see clumps of clouds. If you see clumps of clouds in urine, that's a sign that you have kidney stones developing, or you probably have had kidney stones in the past, because that's the difference between people like me who can pee out mountains of oxalate for years and never see a kidney stone. My kidneys have enough citrate and enough protein production and other 
these inhibitors that keep the clumping down. And so this, they stay as small separate crystals and don't agglomate into a big stone. It's the same disease, whether you get a kidney stone or whether you've just got it all over your body and you're peeing out cloudy urine. It's the same too much oxalate in the body. And you can see often after you have a few days where you don't feel good, you're headachy, you're grumpy, you're achy, your back hurts, something like that. And then you got all those clouds of urine. Well, that's your body was clearing out oxalate. So we can, some of us can tell like, all right, I feel like crap. When is that cloud of urine coming? And lo and behold, there it is. Um, but you see it in all the excretion routes there are. There's skin, there's saliva, there's tears, there's the lungs, so you get mucus production in the lungs, you get uh, histamine production because of the oxalates, because what oxalates, the biggest thing oxalates are doing to us is they're perturbing cells to the point that cells are calling in the immune system over and over and over again. And the inflammasome gets going. So you produce this, the innate immunity system is constantly in fire alarm mode. There's always a problem. And this, the way it gets called in is the cells that are perceiving oxalate in their environment, they perceive it as a danger signal because it's a microcrystal. It's, it is a danger to them. And they spill out their contents and spill out their potassium. The muscle cells of the heart and the musculoskeletal system start losing potassium. That's one of the ways that it's draining us of one, one of many minerals. But that constant... Um, Involvement of the immune system means inflammation and pain and probably autoimmune disease. And I think oxalate is a major um, generator of this feeling of or sense of autoimmunity that's exploding. So what is the, um, so for the person out there that says, hey, I don't know if I have hyperoxalate, you know, I don't know if I have oxalate accumulation or hyperoxaluria or something along those lines. What is, how could someone test that if they were curious? I mean, is there a biopsy? Is there a blood test? Is there some way to, to really know that this is, this is causing an effect on you? Well, I wish there really was a good way to do it. The, the textbook way to do it is to take a chip of bone out of your hip. But who knows if it's the right hip or the right spot of bone. The problem is you will never, ever find a doctor or a lab who will do it for you. So there isn't like a volunteer lab where you can go around your doctor. You know, when I had something cut off my skin, I like worked with my dermatologist before we did this procedure. I said, can you find a lab that will look at my skin and see if they can find any form of oxalates in these things you're cutting off? And she couldn't find one. It isn't possible for her to even do it. Even it took me a while to convince her to look into it. And I sent her three pages of references about skin and the oxalate accumulation in the skin and why it matters. And she couldn't even do it. She was willing to and couldn't. So the only real test is the sudden shift to low oxalate. Do, does it make you sick or do you get better? You're either going to, something's going to get better or you're going to get better for a little while and then start feeling horrible. That's not a good answer. And that's what we're stuck with, with the complete inattention of uh, clinical scientists on it, in any discipline. Yeah, I wonder, uh, you know, because I... I in the past, I was looking at, I got very interested in advanced glycation end products, and there is an autofluorescent skin reader that's out there that does that. And I wonder if, you know, if it does accumulate in the skin, if there's, I wonder if there's a way to, you know, do something along those lines, scan the skin or something like that. I, I, I mean, maybe there is, I mean, you probably know better than I would, but I mean, that might be, you know, potential technology out there. Although, I, who would who'd want to invest in that? I don't know. You know, you know, the same thing. We, we, we don't prioritize things that don't make a lot of money and, and, and so right. Because fundamentally, the real answer is prevention. I mean, you're gonna make yourself weak, sick, tired, and old if you're overdoing oxalates. And, and the undoing of your oxalate problem is, is just as toxic as the doing of the oxalate project. So, so if you spend five years getting toxic with oxalate, you might take another four years getting untoxic with oxalate, that's nine years of metabolic wear and tear you could have just avoided completely. And so there's no money in that. There never has been. But it would really be nice if we could come up with some way to tell. But I think the best way to tell is think about, I have something I call my symptoms and exposure inventory that all my clients fill out. And so here's a list of symptoms that'll fit on a page that are associated with oxalates. And here's a list of high oxalate food. D 
Do you have two or three of these? Have you had any one of these that you love every day or a variety of these that get into your life here and there? It only takes a love of buckwheat where you have buckwheat for breakfast four days a week and then you have a spinach almond, a spinach omelet on the weekends. That might be enough that over time, by the time you're 70, you're sick as a dog and you don't know why. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, obviously there are a lot of causes of disease, you know, and, you know, we would talk about COL exposure, too much sugar exposure, refined carbohydrate exposure, and then we've got oxalates to worry about. So, I mean, it, 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 it becomes very frustrating for people, you know, and then they end up on all meat diets because, you know, but I'm, I'm just saying that uh, what, I mean, you know, what is the likelihood of, of me or a normal person you know, where oxalates is, is, is a problem for me. Um, and, and how has that changed over time? You know, like I said, you know, oxalates have been around for, you know, 150 million years, I'm sure, or longer, however long plants have been producing them. And, you know, presumably humans ate them to some level for a long time, you know, as long as we, you know, at least, at least over since history, written history has been around because we've had societies who've eaten, you know, wheat and grain and, and that sort of thing. And so, how do we know, uh, you know, how do, how do you tell if, if that's really a problem for you based on diet? I mean, what, what would, you know, what would your dietary pattern look like to not be where oxalates would be a problem? You know, because there's, not there's, an oxalate eater. Yeah, no, or not yeah, high or oxalate. You're, you mean you're either not an oxalate eater or you're not an oxalate absorber. So there's something called hyperabsorption of oxalate. Right. So they're saying 10% or more is hyperabsorption and they don't know why so many people are in like 60% absorption. And so there's that, the, the basic vulnerability level, you remember the toxicity range is so wide. So it's your absorption capacity and your excretion capacity. How well can your body deliver it to your kidneys? How well can your kidneys handle it? How well can your tissues um, manage it and move it out? So there's that terrain and i think you know the older you get the more worn out your terrain is and the less you can handle so i think first and foremost we should be protecting the vulnerable from this we should not be serving people in hospitals and nursing homes and children in, in elementary schools these high oxalate foods so a non-high oxalate diet would be weird vegetables a lot of people aren't eating because instead of potatoes you're eating turnips and cauliflower, and most of the cabbage family vegetables are pretty low. Um, kale has a bad reputation as being green and therefore it must be high in oxalate, but it's really only the green curly kale that's high. If you happen to like green curly kale, that's bad, but if you like the dino kale or the purple kale, that's not so bad. You know, so there's these finer points, it's hard to throw this together, but the best example might be thinking about cultures who are, or areas or regions that are high oxalate diets. And India probably wins the prize internationally for the highest oxalate diet that also is kind of a deficient diet because they're very um, modest eaters. They don't believe in gluttony in, like we do in India. So people eat portioned food and they eat turmeric, which is really high in oxalate and other spices, which are high because seeds and spices, most spices are a seed and seeds are um, plants way of of having a future. These seeds are the babies, and this is a, a living form in a dormant state that's holding on to the nutrients it needs in order to germinate. And sort of the egg of a plant is a seed, right? So it's got to have certain nutrients available, including calcium. And so the seed uses oxalate as a way to store calcium during the dormant state. And so almost anything that's a seed is high in oxalate. So many of the spices are high, of course, the whole grains are high, the seeds and nuts are high, you know, poppy seeds, sesame seeds. So if you have a seed or nut-based diet or grain-based diet, that's gonna be high in oxalate. If you don't, what, what are the alternatives? I mean, not many people are living on turnips and lemon juice and there are a lot of low oxalate foods though. I mean, the lettuce thing was probably a good thing because all the lettuces are low, watercress is low, arugula is low. The pumpkin family is low. So, you know, a lot of North American foods were traditionally pumpkins and squash. In colonial era, you'd have ham all winter long with white biscuits, and then you'd have some squash until it ran out. And, and then eventually you might have a few green things, but you know, it was mostly fishing and hunting and ham in colonial America. So you, blueberries are not that high. 
Cranberries are low. So those are um, North American foods, especially in the Northeast. Cranberries and um, blueberries are sort of traditional fruits that you would use a little bit here and there as seasonings, which you wouldn't make a meal out of them. Um, let's see. So tea drinking, this is another thing. So an area in the US that is prone to kidney stones, the kidney stone belt is the same part of the country, which is North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, maybe Virginia. The, the stone belt is the area of the country that drinks sweet tea, grows peanuts and sweet potatoes. Peanuts, sweet potatoes and sweet tea is enough to create a tsunami of kidney stones and aches and pains and oxalate related disorders. No one's actually thought to look at that though, because the theory, the silly theory in medicine is that the reason the stone belt has stones is because it's hot there and they're dehydrated. But Texas and Arizona and Florida are not part of the stone belt. It, it, you know, they don't have heat in Texas, but we have it in South Carolina. That, that makes zero sense because they believe dehydration is the only reason why a kidney stone happens. It has nothing to do with these waves of oxalate in your tea and your sweet potatoes and peanuts. Hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.